So we're going to start from reading Hebrews chapter 6 in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 6 gives us some good instructions about foundational teaching. So when I'll read from Hebrews chapter 6. It tells us in verse 1, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites or instructions about baptisms, that's what that word means, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And he basically says, in God permitting, we will do so. So if I read this again, he's saying, therefore, he's talking to believers and he's saying, therefore, let us move on from the elementary teachings about Christ. Elementary is like kindergarten teaching. So he's basically saying, let's move on from the basic teaching, the kindergarten teaching, and let's move on into maturity. Let's move forward into maturity. And he he names what the foundational teachings are. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. So one of the translations says, repentance from dead works. So you think, what does that even mean? What does repentance from dead works mean? So we have to understand that phrase really well because it's the foundation. If we don't understand why from dead works, why does God say we need to repent from dead works? So we're going to understand that in this first lesson, this message. Um, the other one is faith towards God. It would be great to understand what it really means to have faith in God and faith towards God, having a relationship. Because everything we do with God is by faith. Okay? The other one is the, do- the teachings about baptisms. So water baptism is one of them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you receive the Holy Spirit. You get filled with the Holy Spirit. And the other one um, talks about the resurrection of the dead. That's an interesting one. The resurrection of the dead, where how is God going to resurrect us in the last days? The Bible says there's a resurrection of the just and there's a resurrection of the unjust. So we want to understand that. These are the teachings we will go through in the next few uh, weeks. And then um, eternal judgment. Wouldn't you want to know how is God going to judge the world? The Bible tells us exactly how he's going to judge. So eternal judgment, there's a lot of believers that try to grow their walk and they don't understand the foundation. They don't know. If you ask them, how's God going to judge the world? They go, uh, I don't know. They don't even know. They can't tell you how God's going to judge the world. Yet the Bible is really clear on how he's going to do it. Now that, to me, is really clear. That's foundational stuff. And you wouldn't build a house on a bad foundation. And the, the, when you go to the city, when they build massive buildings, massive skyscrapers, when you look through the, you know, the white um, wood that they put up and all the barricade and that. You look through the little gaps they have, they're massive, massive deep hole. They go deep, really, really deep because they're going to go high. So the bigger the building, the deeper the foundation because foundation is everything. A lot of Christians don't have much foundation because they haven't, they haven't even laid the foundation. So foundation is so, so important. You've got to believe the right stuff. If you believe the truth, and to me it's like pillars. In this building we've got pillars around us. And when you build a big building, you've got to have, yes, you have the foundation, then you've got pillars that hold the slabs. So the pillars are like the pillars of truth. And so we're going to go for some real important pillars of truth. So these are six here, but we also teach on prayer, on how to pray, how to talk with God. Prayer is not just a one-way conversation, it's a dialogue. We talk with God, He talks back to us. So we're going to talk about how to pray. Um, We're also going to talk about righteousness, It's a very powerful subject that basically means right standing with God. How we have right standing with God through what Jesus did on the cross. And then we're going to talk on giving, what it means to be generous. And we're going to talk about uh, serving as well. So there's other other subjects that we we cover because we believe they're foundational stuff in the Bible. Okay, So Matthew chapter 7 talks about, if you want to quickly turn to it, I just want to quickly look at that as as a basic teaching. Matthew... Chapter 7 says, Jesus says, let me read it. Therefore, every one of you who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So if you hear the word and you put it into practice, you're like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, and winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus says, and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So there's two, there's two pictures. If I can paint the picture in our minds really clearly, if you can watch me. There's two houses, very, very clearly. Jesus says, if you hear my words and do my words, practice my word, put my word into practice, everyday life, then you're like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The wind, the, 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 the floods come, the rains come. That's the storms of life. Storms of life comes to people that obey, uh, believe in God and obey God. But the, the house is founded on a rock. The foundation is a rock. So when the winds blew against and rain came, it had nowhere to go. It's got a strong foundation. It's not moving. The house stood. The same, now then another person, he hears the word of God and he only hears it. He doesn't do it. So you can go to church or you can read the Bible. You can hear it, but if you don't put it into practice, if you don't live the word of God and live what you hear, yes, this one's a foolish person, Jesus says. I'll liken you like a foolish person. You're building your house on sand. Now the winds come, the rains come, the floods come. It comes to both people, one that does the word, one that doesn't. Now if I, if I went to St. Susie, Brightly Sands, and I saw someone starting to bricklay on the sand there, right there on the beach, and he's making a house right there on the sand, we'd be, what's wrong with this guy? It's so silly. Because as soon as the rains come and, move, and softens the sand, the foundation, the walls are all going to move and crack, and we know it's going to fall. We know in the natural, why would you do that? But Jesus is trying to give us a picture. My words are rock. So if I was to ask you, why did one house stand and one house fall? What would be the answer? The foundation's not right. The foundation's not right. It had nothing to do with the storms. Most times we blame the storms. One, the only reason why one stood is the foundation was right. This foundation's wrong, it, it fell. But in life, we generally blame the storm. So if I go for a hard time, I'm going for a hard time, you don't know what I'm going for, I, just, I lost my job, I've, I've gone bankrupt, I lost everything, or you know, I've, I, I've lost, you lost a loved one, or you know, my mum died of cancer, or I got divorced, or, or you know, we, the storm's really, really bad, that's why I'm crumbling, I'm having a nervous breakdown, I'm freaking out, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm under anxiety, I'm under stress, because of this. we blame the storm. We're basically saying the storm's so hard, I can't handle it, I'm crashing. Remember, it's nothing to do with the storm. It's actually everything to do with the foundation. So I've had, uh, me as an example, before I knew Jesus, at the age of 16, 17, I uh, was infatuated with a woman, a girl, and, and I thought it was love and you know, everything. Cut a long story short, she left me for one of my friends and it broke my heart. And I, was, I went to the bottle, I used to get drunk a lot, I was depressed, I used to listen to George Benson, put George Benson on in my bedroom. And I, and I think about, oh, I should have done this, and I could have done this. And I just, in my mind, rewinded it, plus played, rewinded it. And I was in this depression, pretty much. And I actually, I started enjoying this self-pity. I actually started to enjoy the self-pity of feeling sorry for myself, and I should have done this, and I should And I was, I was genuinely down, and I couldn't smile. My brother said, ever, ever since that you're, you know, your girlfriend left you, look, you can't, even, you can't even smile, you don't smile. And, I, and if I went out, I had to drink to even have a good time, right? I had to get it drunk. And so I was, a, I was a wreck. I really was. My house crumbled, basically, so I didn't have a foundation. Now, exactly the same storm hit me when I was a Christian. Exactly the same. I had a, a good relationship. I, I thought she was the right person, but she left me again. And, but this time, I didn't crumble at all. Actually, in my heart of hearts, I'm going to say goodbye. We cried at the airport, said goodbye. I got up the next morning. I went on my knees. I cried out to God. I said, God... I wept, I cried a little bit, let it go, and I said, God, I'm going to move on with my life as if it's wrong to think about this girl. Even though it wasn't wrong to think about it, but I said to God, I said, God, I'm going to move on with my life, and any time that, that the girl came in back in my mind, I'm not going to think about it, because I know you've got the right person for me. I know you've got the best person for me, because there's trust now. So I've got faith now that, God, you're my father, and you're going to take care of me. And I can tell you honestly, I, the next day, not I'm talking a year later, I was still depressed before, I knew Jesus with that incident, with my girlfriend leaving me. Now, another incident, a few years later, as a Christian, she left me and I didn't crumble at all. Emotional, strong, and I moved on with my life as if nothing happened. Same storm, different foundation. Okay? This is the importance of how powerful your belief is and your faith in God. 
It's everything. And that's true of finances. We can go on and on and on. It's true of finances. It's true of relationship. It's true of tragedies you face. It's true of everything we face in life. Jesus uses the troubles of this world as a storms. But the storms never have to crumble your house if you've got the right foundation. And that's what this whole teaching will do for the next two or three months. It probably takes a lot that long. That will teach us how to have the right foundation. So the first most important understanding of what the right foundation is found in Genesis chapter 1. This is one of the strongest pillars you'll have to lay in your life. A pillar of truth that you lay into the foundation. Okay. It's Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Let me read it out. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it. That word subdue is really powerful. Subdue means rule the earth. He's, God's telling mankind to rule, to take dominion. All right, Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on the ground. So here God says, subdue the earth and rule the earth. So who did God give authority to? To mankind. So there's two powerful truths we want to take away from this. And I'm just saying a powerful truth and then you forget about it. I want you to build your whole life on this. Okay? One of them is that God made mankind in the image of God and in the likeness of God. That's a massive, massive pillar of truth. It's something that, this is what we lost, right? If you don't know what we lost, then you never know how to regain. Because Jesus gave us back what we lost. Now, what we lost was the presence of God. So we have to understand clearly, when God made, the Bible says God made us, mankind, male and female, He created them, them together, male and female, make up the image of God. So God, in essence, has nurturing qualities like a woman. Okay, the Male and female together make up the image and the likeness of God. The beautiful thing is when God made Adam, he, the Bible says he formed him from the dirt, the, the ground, formed him a magnificent human being. But you've got to understand, God just finished making the universe by the power of his word. So he spoke the sun into existence, the stars, the universe. He spoke everything. He said, light be and light was. That's how powerful God is. But when it came to mankind, he formed man with his own hands. So this Adam was a magnificent, beautiful, magnificent human being. Not a blemish, not a spot, six pats and everything. Right? He's got a good looking body. But he's not alive yet. The Bible says God stoops down and breathes into him the breath of life into his nostrils. So God went, came down and went, and then man became a living being. So where did the breath of man come from? From the very breath of God. So God's spirit went into Adam, and Adam's, now when he gets up, he, he is made in the image and likeness of God. Now what does that look like? What does that mean even? Well, the, the word in the Hebrew ref, speaks of like, a, a, if I look in the mirror, it's a reflection of me. It's the likeness of me. It's my image, right? So it is like that. It's that word that does refer to that. So what is God like? Now we know Jesus says God is spirit, right? God is a spirit. God doesn't have a physical body, right? But in his spirit, he's a person. So it, what's his character like? What's his nature like? What's God like? First John tells us God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. Not a bit. Not, a, not an ounce of darkness. So when you want to understand who God is, God is light. And there's no darkness, no evil, no selfishness in Him at all. Not an ounce. It's not a little bit of God, good, a little bit of evil. Uh, I fear one of the religions try to say that there's you know, good and evil in God. And it's not true at all. So if God is... I want to explain God this way because I believe this is God's nature. God's nature is love. And in Him there's no selfishness at all. Not an ounce. God is faith. And in Him there's no fear at all. God never has fear, ever. Not a day of fear, not a moment of fear. God is peace, and in Him there's no de uh, despair at all, no anxiety, no stress. God's presence, He never stresses out. He's not on the throne 
and going, oh my God, look what's happening in the Middle East. What am I going to do? Oh, that's right, I'm God. No, no he's not freaking out. He's not going to, he doesn't worry ever. God is joy, full of joy, and no depression at all, ever. So we can go on and on and on. Why is this important? Because God made us in his image. God made us in his likeness. So Adam had those qualities. Had faith, no fear. Had joy, no depression. Had peace, no, no, no anxiety, no worry, no stress at all. Had, had, uh, had uh, humility, no pride whatsoever. He had no shame. Adam had no guilt. Because God has no guilt. Right? How do we know that? Because when he fell, he lost all that. Now this is Adam and Eve before the fall. So I, God is light. I reckon Adam had brilliant light coming out of his face, out of his being. I, bl I believe he was glowing with the presence and glory of God. I mean, splendor and glory, like his face probably shined brighter than the sun. That's how powerful Adam would have been, right? Because we're made in his image. We forget. I mean, Jesus was a second Adam or a last Adam, the Bible says. And when he was in the mountain transfiguration, Peter, James and John were up there. The glory cloud comes down and God speaks. The Bible says Jesus' face shined brighter than the sun and his clothes were like lightning. So that's the glory came through. It was always in him, but it was coming through. So Adam was uh, like that, but Adam and Eve were in the garden. God made a beautiful garden. It, it, was, it was a paradise. There was heaps and heaps of trees in the garden with lots of fruits in them, and there was a lot of things to do. And God said, you can, you're free to eat of every tree in this garden. There's only one thing I don't want you to do. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, I don't want you to touch it. And this is what God says. In the day that you eat it, you will die. In the day you eat it, you'll die. Now, I believe that tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents one thing. I'm quite str I believe this strongly, that God's saying, there's many things you can do in the will of God. There's many beautiful things. There's trees, and gar there's gardens, there's fruit you can eat of all of this. But the only thing I don't want you to do, Adam and Eve, is to do your own thing. That's the sin. To say, I don't want to follow you, God. I want to do my thing. That's what that tree represents. Okay? Because when they, they basically said, what happened is, the Bible says, um, Satan, the devil, spoke through a snake. And the snake said, did God really say you not to touch it? He, he questioned God's integrity. So what the devil tried to do in Adam and Eve, say, don't really believe God. Don't believe his integrity. So when they, they, when they took of it, they're saying, God, I don't trust you. I don't believe you. I know you, I don't believe you want the best for us because what we see looks really good to the taste. It looks really good. And the devil lied to them and said, if you eat it, you'll be like God. That was a lie because they were already, already like God. So now he's lying to them and they basically he, Adam and Eve made a decision to listen to the, the lies rather than truth, to trust their eyes, what they could see, and say, I don't trust you. So... The separation, the reason why they lost the presence of God is because they basically said, we don't want to follow you, we want to follow our own, own thing, okay? What happened then? The Bible says, as soon as they ate of it, remember what God said, if you eat of it, you'll die. So as soon as they ate of it, the presence of God left them because they disobeyed God and they spiritually died. They didn't physically die. Physically, they're still alive. They didn't drop dead physically, but spiritually, they lost the presence of God. They lost the nature of God. So remember we are talking about they're full of faith? Now fear has come in. The Bible says they, they, they saw their nakedness. Before they were naked and didn't notice they were naked. They were absolutely fine about it, husband and wife. But now <gasps> they covered themselves. They even went and get fig leaves and covered them as shame. They're guilty. They're feeling yuck. They're feeling shame. And then the Bible says the Lord God came in the cool of the garden to fellowship and talk with them face to face. And you know what God says? calls out to them, really beautiful, powerful words. You know, he says, he says, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? It's powerful words. Because God's not asking because he doesn't know the, where he is. God's asking because he wants Adam to know where he is. So when God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't, he's looking for an answer because he doesn't know. He's asking you a question to pose it to you so you can answer, where am I? Even now, he could be saying that to us now. Where are you in regards to a relationship with me? Where are you? Because he longs for that. You've got to remember, Adam and Eve just plunged humanity into sin. 
That means they, darkness came into them and every single person that was ever born after Adam and Eve were born in sin, born in separation. So in God's eyes, God knew all that, the repercussions of the, their disobedience. God knew the consequences. God knew that they just plunged humanity into thousands and thousands of years into depravity, into sin, into death, into war, into murder, into rapes, into innocent people getting killed. If I was God, I would have went, what have you done? What have you done? I would have lost it. But God didn't. God just walked in. He says, Adam, where are you? That's very peaceful, very gentle, not angry. And Adam says this. He says, Lord, when I heard you, when I heard the sound of you walking in the garden, I was afraid. So I hid. See? Why was he afraid? Fear came. Before he didn't have fear. Now he's got fear. And I'm hiding. So ever since, humanity's been hiding from God. And you know where he was hiding? Behind the tree. You know what a tree represents? A created thing. Ever since, we hide behind created things from the Creator. It could be material things, it could be money, it could be, it could be anything, but you know, we hide behind created things from the one who loves us, the one who wants to fellowship with us, look into our beautiful eyes, look into His beautiful eyes. Yet we ran away because of fear and guilt. And God says, who told you you were naked? So he knew that he lay out of the tree. So that brought a separation. That brought um, their spirit that was still there died. What that, what that means is their spirit that's still inside a man is spiritually dead to God. It's no longer got a connection to God. God's presence left their body. And that's why death came. That's why sickness came. That's why the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. Humans were created to live forever. Even scientists that say that our cells are rejuven rejuvenated, rejuvenated, yeah, regenerated. Thank you. I was thinking of rejuvenated, but regenerated every seven years, and they, can, they they still can't put their finger on why are we growing old? Why do we get old? How do we fix that? How do we? How do we? You can't change that because that's the wages of sin. So, so without sin, we would have lived forever because we're in God's presence, but we lost God's presence. So when we understand what we lost, then we can understand correctly what Jesus brought back to us. Because Jesus restored everything we lost. That's what you've got to understand. The gospel, you know the word gospel, it means good news. Why is it good news? Because it's good news. And the reason why it's good news is it's got to be bad news. Good news is not good news if there's no bad news. The bad news is without Christ, we all go to hell for all eternity and we're separated from God. But the good news is God loved us so much that He sent His Son to pay the penalty and pay for our judgment and take our place on the cross. Okay. And, and it's a much deeper than that. It's never just, oh, He died for our sins because Jesus took our place. Now that our sins have been forgiven, means our body, which is a temple, is cleansed. When your body is cleansed, the Holy Spirit can live in you again. So that's what happens. When you get born again, basically your spirit that was dead is made alive. When it's made alive, the Holy Spirit can live inside your spirit. And he, he makes his home in you again, just like Adam, that he had God's presence. So if, my, if, if I'm not born again, remember Jesus said in John chapter 3, he goes, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God, or you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he go back into his mother's womb? and be born again. He's thinking physically. Jesus says, no, no, you're not, you're not thinking the right way. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Our physical body gives birth to babies, physical babies. But spirit gives birth to spirit. That's what Jesus says. He says, marvel not. Don't freak out that, you, that I say to you, you must be born again because the spirit of God has to give birth to our dead spirit. If my spirit's dead, anything I do is dead works. That's why repentance from dead works. So I'm spiritually dead and I'm trying to be good to have my sins forgiven. Because my spirit is already dead to God, whatever I do is a dead work. That's what that, that phrase Paul is saying. Repent, I mean, or the writer of Hebrews says repentance from dead works. See, only, only God knows my heart and only God knows your heart. So I might look like I'm doing something good, but God knows why I'm doing it. Like I might even give money to the poor and you might, and if people look at me giving money to the poor, you might go, wow, look at him. He must be a really nice person to give money to the poor. 
but maybe I'm giving money to the poor because I'm feeling guilty and I'm trying to get rid of my bad conscience. I'm feeling bad for what I've done, so I'm going to try to do something good to make up for the bad I've done. So that's not a good work. That's a dead work. Okay? Um, if I see a person in the streets and they're, they're homeless and I think to myself, I should do something good so I can go to heaven. I should buy some food. And if I buy some food and give him lunch and give him something to eat, maybe God will see it as a good brownie point and, and it might be a tick for me in heaven and give me a better chance to go to heaven. Now just think about it for a moment. If that's my motive, what am I doing it for? Am I doing it because he's hungry? Am I doing it because I, I love that person and he needs help? Or am I doing it for me? I'm doing it for me. So even though outwardly go, wow, look at Leo, he's helping that poor person. It might look good, but only God knows the heart. That's what I'm referring to about the dead works, is that God knows our hearts. So everyone, every single person on the planet is spiritually dead. We're all sinners. That's why we all need a saviour. Right? Jesus, God knew the answer to humanity was to send Jesus to die on the cross for their sins. And, and offer salvation, offer forgiveness of sins, for free. So when a gift is that, isn't it? A gift is a gift. If God gives you a gift, He says, I want to give you salvation for free. I want to give you salvation for free. And you go, oh, hang on a sec. Like if, if someone bought a gift for you, it's usually out of appreciation and love, right? So someone buys something, they spend time together at the shops, they buy something you need, something you like, they wrap it all up and they just say, look, I just want to show you I love you and they give you a gift. Imagine receiving that gift and you go, oh, what do I have to do to... What do, I, what do you want me to do? Can I mow your lawns? Can I wash your car? Can I wash your house in return? What, how much was it? Can I pay for it? Like, imagine if you did that to someone that gave you a gift. We do that to God. What do I have to do for this gift of salvation? What do I have to do? How, how much do I have to pay for it? How good do I have to be? At what point do I earn it? Now I deserve it. No, you can never earn it. You can never deserve it. It's a gift. Just receive it. He's paid for it. He said, Lord, I receive this gift because you love me. And when you receive it by faith, it washes you clean for free. And because you receive it by faith, faith is here in the Spirit. When you receive it here, then you want to serve God. You want to love Him back. And you stay free. You don't have religion, you have relationship. Because I want to love God back. That's what happened to me. At the age of 19, you know, when, when I started to change, little by little I started to realise how much God loved me, what He's done for me on the cross, how He paid the penalty, that Jesus died for me. He was sinless. He paid the penalty for me. I fell in love with God more and more. The more I understood it, the deeper I understood it, the more I wanted to love Him. And it comes from the heart. So it, it actually comes from the inside out. It's a beautiful thing. Now that is very, that whole nature of God understanding that God has restored that in Christ. We lost it, but God gave it back to us because Jesus paid the penalty. The other questions that a lot of people ask is, if God's a good God, why is there so many bad things happening? Why are so many poor people? Why are there so much starving? Why is so much suffering? Why many wars? Why are people killing each other? Like God, if God's a good God and He's a loving God, He's obviously all-powerful, why does He let that happen? A lot of people ask that question. Sometimes people are, to the point of angry at God. You know, I've, I've been out in the streets and trying to talk to people about Jesus. And so I remember one guy lost his temper. He goes, well, where was God? My, my mum died in an airplane accident. Angry, like God let him, God killed him. Well, he didn't. But that's how angry they were. Like, because they got this understanding or this wrong understanding or wrong notion that if God's God, why did he let that person die? Why is he allowing suffering to be on the earth? Now, there's, there's, there's two real powerful truths why first of all remember we're made in God's image we're made in God's nature the other thing he gave us a free will all right the free will is a very powerful thing the fact that we got a free will is because God's got a free will right but we, we, we're a free moral being we're, in other words a free moral agent what does that mean if I'm free what does that mean to be free I can think my own thoughts, you can think your own thoughts. You can think your own thoughts and you can make your own decisions. You're free all the time. Free will means you can make your own decisions. Right now you're all seated here and you've made a decision to sit here and listen to me. Right? You can at any point say, you know what, Leo, I've had enough. I don't want to listen to you anymore. I'm getting up and I'm leaving. That's your choice. It's your freedom. So your will is in motion all the time. Even when you think you're not making a decision, 
It's always in motion. Your will is in motion. So if we choose to say, I don't want to follow you, God. I want to follow myself or I want to follow evil. There's good and there's evil. If we choose evil, there's consequences to evil. If I choose evil and I do evil, I'm going to reap the, the judgment of it. I'm going to reap the consequences. It's just the way we're created. We, God had to create us this way. He had to make us free. If God didn't give us a free will, let's take away the free, free will. Let's imagine God created us without a free will. So now I don't have a freedom of choice anymore. What would I be? So he's created us. First of all, we're not going to be able to be created in his image. But let's say somehow he could create us without a free will. What would I be? I'd be saying, um, Leo, what are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing today. I'm doing whatever God made me to do. Even my response is given to me by God to respond to you the way he wants me to respond to you. I wouldn't be free. I'd be a robot. Because people say, well, why, God, why couldn't God just make us only to do good? Because he, he would have to program you to only be able to do good, then you wouldn't have a freedom of choice. You wouldn't be free anymore. That's a very powerful truth because you have to be free or else you're a robot. We've got computers, we've even got robots these days, but you've got to program them to do what you want them to do. And that's what we would have been without a free will. God would have programmed us to only do good and only obey His instructions. And we wouldn't enjoy our life because we wouldn't be a, a real human being. We wouldn't be made in the image of God. So that free will is really, really important. Why are there so many bad things in the world? Because there's evil in the world. There's a free will and people have chosen evil. If a man chooses to, out of lust for money and lust for power and he wants to fame and he wants power and authority and he doesn't care who he steps on, that's his freedom of choice and he destroys people in the process. That's not God. That's a person's free will. Why is there wars in the world? You know what I mean? Like, why are there wars? Evil people fighting against each other. You know, there's, there's all sorts of crazy, evil things happening in the world, but people got a free will. The other thing that is connected to why is there sickness and why there's all that stuff, why there's pain, why is there suffering, is that God has given... Someone take him out. Let's just cut this out. Um, uh, that's all right. Well, I'll just have to cut it out. I'll just wait. Please take him out. Um, we're going downstairs. So, so. You looked at it? Yeah. That's good. Okay, so the other one is that God gave us authority of the earth. So in other words, he gives you the authority. God says, I create you in my image, my likeness. And he goes, I want you to rule. I want you to exercise authority. So if God gives authority to mankind, who's got the authority to rule the earth? We do. The authority is in our hands. See, that's just the way God created everything. God's not going to give his word and says, I give you the authority because you're in my image, in my likeness, and I want you to do good out of your relationship with me. And then God doesn't take that back because we broke our word. We break our you know, word. We, we disobey him. He's not going to go, oh, give it back to me now. God won't break his word. When God speaks, when God says something, he's not going to change his mind and say, oh, I, I know I said that, but I'll, I'll take it back. So he's given us a free will, but he's also given us authority. So who's in authority in this earth? Mankind is. So if there's poor people, how are we going to fix the problem? Well, when, when people, mankind have enough love to say, let's, let's, let's feed those poor people. So in other words, the responsibility is on us. Okay? The reason why there is evil, the reason why there is wars, because we've got authority and we're destroying it. Okay? Even this earth, this whole earth is under a curse because yes, Adam and Eve lost the presence of God. Our, our bodies received the curse. We've got sin and sickness and all that and disease and we grow old. Even the earth is under that. So when earthquakes happen or a, or a, or a tornado or, or a twister or um, any storms that destroy life, that's not God destroying life. That's the curse of the earth reeling under sin. It's not God saying, I'm going to destroy this area. God doesn't do that. He's not that type of person. God is love. I mean, in heaven, there's no sickness, is there? No disease. There's no wars. There's also no storms. There's no earth. There's no heaven quake. You know, there's nothing that's going to hurt anybody in heaven. And yet Jesus prayed this prayer. He goes, Lord, we pray this prayer that your will be done here on earth as your will is in heaven. 
So what's the will of God? That the way they live in heaven will be done here on earth. Jesus taught us to pray that. Is there any sickness in heaven? No, God's got no sickness to give, to give anybody. God has never, ever given anybody sickness because he hasn't got any sickness to give anybody. He's never given anyone d disease because God doesn't do that. Okay? And same with, the, again, the earthquakes. If, yeah, it, it's, and the earth is connected to our relationship with God anyway. If there's a nation that says, I don't want to serve you, I don't want to turn my back on you, we're going to serve false gods, then the earth, the ground, the heavens don't respond the way they were created to. They're actually created to respond to children of God that love God and the earth would function better and work properly. So yes, bad things happen because they're worshipping false gods to some degree, but that's not God's will. That doesn't, that's not what God wants to happen. That's just, it's like if there's rain and I get out of my umbrella and I get under the rain, I'm going to get wet. The umbrella is the protection of God. If I say, I don't want the protection of God, I'm just going to disobey, well, I'm going to get wet. I'm going to have consequences. Okay? Um, all right. So in your manuals, there's lots of scriptures I would like for you to look through in your own time. We talked about, this is coming to a close. We talked about, um, about our spirit dying, the book of Genesis, because they disobeyed God. Our spirit, in the day that you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you would die. So in Ephesians chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, in Colossians, it says, You were dead in your transgressions. You were dead in your sins. When you were dead in your sins, again in Colossians, Romans 5, and in this way death came to all men. So what's he referring to? If I read Ephesians chapter 2, it says, You were dead in your sins and in your trespasses. Well, hang on a sec. When was I dead? I'm physically alive reading this. So what is it talking about? It's not talking about my physical body. It's talking about my spirit man my spiritual body, my spirit that's inside of me. That part of me was dead. And then when you accept Christ, the spirit man comes alive. I was dead, but now I'm alive in Christ. The part of you that gets resurrected is your spirit man. So what part of you got born again? Your spirit that was dead is born again to life. And now Christ lives in you. Okay? And that's, you can read it in Romans 5. That the, 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 the reason why death came to all man is because death came through Adam. So if Adam sinned, death came to everyone, then another person, Jesus Christ, lived righteous so that righteousness can come to all men. Right standing with God to be, could come to all men. Okay? Do you know Jesus said to the most religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees were priests of his day. They hated Jesus. They, they, the ones who crucified Jesus. And you know what he said to them? It says in John chapter 8, verse 44, he says, you belong to your father, the devil. You think Jesus is saying something out of lying? He just can never lie. He always speaks the truth. He's God. So he says, you are of the father, your father, the devil, and you would want to kill me because your father's a murderer and you want to kill me if you could. So he's saying to them, you are of your father, the devil. So their, their nature is the devil's nature. Because when you're spiritually dead, you inherit the nature of the devil. And Adam... If I could say it this way, Adam was born, remember he was in the nature of God, he's in the image of God, the nature of God. When he spiritually died, he was born from life, the nature of God, into death, spiritual death. And he lost the nature of God. Right? Every person that's born after Adam is born into sin and born into death. And when you and I are born, we're actually automatically born into sin automatically born into spiritual death. Jesus came through a virgin birth. Mary was a virgin. Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and that's how Jesus came. His father was God. Okay, And it's very, doctors and scientists know that the blood, uh, the, the baby in the mother's womb, the baby's blood never mixes with the mother's blood. Even though the mother is giving birth to the baby, your blood and the baby's blood never mixes. I believe that the blood that the, the children have starts from when the, when the the sperm of the dad, the father, hits the egg. So Jesus never had Mary's blood in his vein. He had God the Father's blood in his vein. That's why he had to come through a virgin birth. So that God had to bring another Adam. He had to bring another perfect man on this earth to die for our sins. If Mary's blood went into Jesus, Mary, even though she was an amazing woman, very blessed, 
we, we, we respect her, we honor her greatly above all women, but the Bible never tells us to pray to Mary, right? The Bible says Mary actually said, this is what Mary said, that Jesus was her Lord and her Savior. Jesus, so Mary needed a Savior. So Mary basically needed someone to save her, but Mary was blessed because she brought in the Son of God to this earth, right? And so now Jesus, you see, is born in life, isn't he? Born, he's not born in sin, he's born in the nature of God. He has the nature of God. He has God in him. And now he's a perfect man, like Adam, in the image and nature of God. Because he's like that, he goes on the cross, and in a sense, hear what I'm saying, he gets born again. Why does he get born again? He gets born again twice. Because he's in the nature of God on the cross, made in the image of God, he's going to become sin. So now um, he's fully alive with God. He gets born again from the nature of God into sin, into death. He loses the nature of God and becomes sin. What is sin? It's death. And then he gets buried in, in, the, in the grave. What happens after that? He gets resurrected. He's born again again. He gets erected from, because he was spiritually dead in the grave, he gets resurrected and he gets born again again into the nature of God, reverses the curse for us. We just have to be born again once. Does that make sense? We get born again because we're born in sin, but now when we put our faith in Christ, we get resurrected and get born again. But it's all through faith. You find this scripture here. It's all through faith in Christ. You find in Ephesians chapter 2, for it is by grace you have been saved. Verse 8 and 9, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's not yourselves, good works. It's not you being good enough. It is the gift of God. Beautiful, isn't it? The gift of God. God gave it to you as a present. Not by works. What does that mean? Not by works. Not by good works. So that no one can boast. See, if it was by works, if, if I got saved by my good works, I could say to you, I was such a good person. I was doing all these good things that God wanted to save me. <coughs> What's that? I'm boasting about me being good. But none of us are good enough. It's God that's good. Okay? And if, if Titus chapter 3 says the same thing. Verse 4 and 7. He saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. Isn't that beautiful? Not that we've done anything. He did it on the cross. He paid the full price. Like the full price of my forgiveness and your forgiveness has been dealt, paid for, for and then we're fully, fully forgiven as if we've never sinned. So when you put your faith in Christ, God treats you as if you've never sinned. So if you had an account towards God, God deletes it. It doesn't even exist. It's gone. That's the Bible. So what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind which brings a change of lifestyle. So you change the way you think, change the way you see things. Repentance is a change of one's inward thoughts, inward ideas, inward attitude and mind, which brings about an outward change of action and lifestyle. So that's what repentance is. The word repent means to change your mind in the Greek, the original scripture. All right? So what makes a, tr a person truly repent? According to the Bible, it's Romans chapter 2. It says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. All that I'm sharing, I'm trying to share the goodness of God. I'm trying to share the gospel, which is good news. It's how God is so loving, so merciful, so gracious that He sent Jesus. So when you see the goodness of God, I didn't realize God was so good and how much He loves us. I want to, I want to get saved. I want to follow Him. If God is that beautiful, why wouldn't I want to follow Him? That's really what it is. I love 1 Corinthians 15. says, For what I received, Paul says, I passed on to you as first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And in Romans 4 verse 25, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Justification is another word to say, just as if I've never sinned. He was delivered to death for our sins and was raised to life. Jesus was raised to life for our justification so that I was treated like as if I never sinned. Isn't that beautiful? So what do we repent towards? We repent towards God and we repent from sin. We repent from selfishness. I repent from um, us following our own ways. So we're no longer just following our own ways. We're saying, God, we follow you. We follow your word. Okay? How does Jesus become Lord of our life? By following his word. So how do I know what Jesus says? Do I read the word? I read the Bible? 
and he instructs me as my Lord and as your Lord, he tells me how do I live my life. And I say, Jesus, I make you my Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. I hope you've got questions. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We do appreciate your word. It's amazing to, 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 to delve into it, even to speak about your word, Lord, and to speak what we're speaking right now. Thank you so much. You make this clear, Lord, that it's not just um, head knowledge, it's not just a theory, it's not man's message, it's your message, it's your way, it's your truth. It's the only way we can come to a loving relationship with you, Father. So I pray for every single one in this room that will know and put our faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, not in religion, not in institutions, not in organisations, not in man, I know what people say, but what your word says and you, Lord, and put our faith in you, Jesus. And I thank you, you accept us, you receive us, you forgive us and you cleanse us from everything we've ever done wrong because we put our faith in you, in Jesus' name.